Thank you. So a lot of people have asked if we will record this meeting because um, they can't be here, they have other obligations. So they're very interested in hearing this uh, presentation. So we will have several presenters today. First of all, we will start with the Irish Red Cross in a few seconds when we have more people coming in. We will have uh, Kerry McGovern. I hope I pronounce it rightly, otherwise you will come on and tell me how to pronounce it. Um, and I will have to admit people, so you will take yeah. over and say what is going to happen. Yes. So um, thank you, Kerry, for uh, well, you will explain most, most um, what you are going to present, but thank you for your, your availability. But today we are going to hear more about the um, PSA and complex re situation and reactions. And for your um, presentation, it will be in the tension environment. So we look forward to hear more. It um, we are going. I'm also here um, from Sarah uh, Seisberg from uh, DRC on the um, a new PSA training model on complex uh, situation and reaction, and we look forward um, to know how um, it was tested and piloted. And please, would you mute your phones out there, folks? Mute your phones if you are not presenting. We will go to the first presenter just in two seconds. Somebody is not, uh, otherwise I will mute you. Um, what we want to say is we have new upcoming things from the PS Center. We have today, uh, we're going to release today or tomorrow a new manual, which is called Supportive Voices, uh, which is um, a framework for how you can set up and run helplines or chat helplines in MHPSS or helplines that has a component where people may call in, it can be for cash, but they call in and they have other needs. That's one thing, and Patricia is going to show you the other yeah. new thing we have. Uh, I'm really pleased to inform that uh, the well-being guide have been put it in well-being cards. Um, so looking forward to have some training and try it in the caring for staff and volunteer, but also try it on our own self. Should we try at the end? looking forward yeah. to eat so each card each uh, exercise it was was in a car with the whole uh, instruction i don't know if you can see well and of course the different topics where it comes from right and without further ado let's jump right into the presentation and you will be admitting people there's another one that used to be irish Red cross joining us so, um, Carrie, over to you, and uh, you're going to show your slides, and we have Good the back. Good morning, everybody. It's um, nice to see everybody on a semi Sunday or a semi sunny Irish um, Wednesday, but nice to be here. And thank you for inviting myself and my colleague, Graeme Beth Simmons, onto this webinar. We're delighted to be here. And we look forward to sharing with you our experiences of the community based health and first aid program um, in detention. So um, without further ado, um, I suppose just to introduce myself briefly, um, Carrie McGowan is my name and I am the program manager for the Red Cross program here, the CBHFA program here in Irish prisons. Um, I've been working with the Red Cross for the past eight years and previous to that I was working in prisons as a psychotherapist. So all my experience to date has been in the prisons. And Graeme, will I pass it over to you to do a, a short introduction for yourself? Graeme, I think you might be on mute. Or oh, no, we might have lost Graham, but no doubt he'll come back to us anyway. Um, so uh, basically, um, I will start. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Community Based Health and First Aid program in prisons, how it was established and where we are at now with um, expanding the program from prison to community. And then Graeme is going to come on and talk to you about an exciting new initiative, which we have been developing over the last number of years, um, which takes the form of um, setting up a global hub for CBHFA in detention. So he has um, some exciting news to share with you on how we have been extending 
um, and sharing our our experience and, and our knowledge of CBHFA in detention and passing that knowledge on to, to other national societies worldwide. So for those of you that, that might not know what community-based health and first aid is, it's an international Red Cross, Red Crescent um, program, which is operating in many different communities all around the world and has been for a number of years. Um, what is interesting about the Irish model is that we adapted it to suit a prison setting back in 2009 when it was piloted in one prison, Wheatfield Prison here in Dublin. And how it was established was through a partnership with um, the Irish Red Cross, um, the Irish Prison Service and the probation um, board here, the probation service here in Ireland and specifically um, alongside the education and training boards here in Ireland. So without the partnership, I think that that's what made the, the golden nugget for us. It's It was about establishing partnerships um, and bringing together services that would have um, traditionally been working in silos and bringing them together. Um, for if you look at a prison in itself, it is um, a community. Um, so we see the the landings, the, the streets and the cells as the homes in those communities. And where you have any community, you have room for voluntary work. And what we were most surprised about was the number of people that were inmates that were interested in utilizing their time um, in a positive way and being able to have an opportunity to give back in some way. So it was established as a pilot um, in Weedfield Prison and by 2014 the program had been extended to all of the 14 prisons in Ireland and since then we have ran each year in each prison in Ireland um, a cycle of the community-based health and first aid program um, to, yeah, each year under that partnership. So how it works, I suppose, is within the prison, um, you'll see here that we have the inmates at the centre of the, the, the whole crux of the programme re revolves around these inmate volunteers, but providing a wraparound support to them. Um, so we have governors, chiefs and prison officers that are recruited from each of the prisons that um, are sensitized to the program and provide operational support so that anything, any projects that the volunteers develop or any activities that are planned are supported from the top down as well as from the ground up. We have nurses that are already employed by the, the prison service that come to the classroom each week when the volunteers meet and they provide, um, I suppose, skills and expertise, advice, information, et cetera. Um, we have assistant psychologists, um, which were, um, I suppose, a, a new addition to the, the, the team in the prisons over the last couple of years and have been a really valuable um, addition to the team as such. Um, so basically in each prison, we have an assistant psychologist that is there to, um, I suppose, promote health and well-being, to provide psychoeducation to the volunteer inmates who in turn will develop projects and activities, etc., and figure out how they pass the knowledge that they learn from these experts in the classroom. How do they pass this on to the rest of their community? We have addiction counsellors, so each year when the volunteers um, do a community assessment, which is part of the programme, um, they would um, I, oh, nearly always identify um, mental health as one of the main issues, um, addiction being up there also. So we are lucky to have addiction counsellors as part of the team that will provide knowledge, expertise and their, I suppose, advice with projects related to, to, to drugs and addiction. We have um, our team um, that, that um, travel around, I suppose, to the various different prisons. We are a team of six at the moment. Um, and we provide, um, I suppose, the support to the teams and ensure that the program runs as according to how it's supposed to run. We provide support to the teachers. We provide 
um, regular meetings, um, I suppose, help to troubleshoot any issues that might arise. Um, and most importantly, then we have teachers who are employed within the prison system um, who take on an additional task of teaching the Red Cross inmates the CBHFA program. So it's all about all of these services were already um, established within the prison, but worked um, in their own individual areas. You know, teachers didn't um, and nurses didn't communicate really with um, curriculum, um, any sort of curriculum, I suppose, in terms of providing health education or anything like that to inmates. So this was really the first program in the prison system here in Ireland that brought all of these services together um, and utilised the inmate volunteers that were recruited so that they could be the Jesuits of information, that they could teach these volunteers what they need to know and 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 figure out how they pass that information on to the masses in the in the prisons and it's been very successful to date so there are five core modules which are compulsory in the program the first obviously is red cross red crescent knowledge um, it's very important, as I'm sure you will all agree, um, that the volunteers understand what the Red Cross is about, um, specifically the principles that guide the, the movement um, and what it means to volunteer and their role as part of this organisation that does such good work all around the world. So there's always a sense of pride of being part of that, you know, when somebody is in prison um, and all of their liberties have been taken away. It's something positive that they can do with their time that they feel good about and they get a real sense of, you know, being able to make a difference and they can, you know, are capable of doing good things, etc. So there's this realisation that comes um, with the title of being a Red Cross volunteer in prison. Community mobilization and communication is the second module. Um, very important. Um, literacy issues are typically quite low in the prisons. Um, and so um, communication or ways of communication haven't always been the most, um, I suppose, practiced and versed in an appropriate way throughout um, their experiences. So we do spend quite a bit of time um, working on communication skills and there are many communication barriers in prisons, as you can imagine, that, you know, will need to be overcome and managed in a sensitive way. So we spend quite a bit of time working um, on communication skills and building those up so that when they learn in the classroom and they pass this information on to their peers, that they're in the best place to be able to do this and do, doing it in the most effective way. Behaviour and community change is um, the third module um, as part of the programme. And that comes about as a result of the projects um, and the personal development that comes with, with taking part of the programme. So we've had um, a, a lot of examples over the years of real community change from um, volunteers educating um, other prisoners about um, mental health and well-being topics, um, from teaching them about, you know, promoting a culture of non-violence and peace, from um, harm reduction in terms of overdose prevention work, etc. There's been numerous projects that have made a huge difference in the pro in 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 the communities within the prisons and no doubt in the in the their own lives as well. Um, first aid is part of of it. So the volunteers themselves will learn um, basic first aid skills, which obviously have come in useful um, from time to time within the prison, but it's something that they can take with them on the outside. But the whole crux of the programme is about doing a community assessment. So the volunteers will be guided and supported to assess their community and identify some target subjects or, you know, what are the issues here? So they might speak to um, 
key stakeholders within the prisons. They might um, interview a nurse and ask, you know, from professional opinions, what are the issues here that you are seeing in the surgery? They might interview um, an addiction counselor, psychologist, you name it, the, the, the experts in, in the areas. But also there's experts by lived experience and that's those that live in the prisons. So they would ask their peers, they might, might hold some focus groups um, to, you know, say, you know, what are the issues that you're experiencing here in the prison and what is our role or what could we do as volunteers to assist? So they spend quite a bit of time gathering, as you can see here, um, all their information and painting the walls um, with all of the data that's, that has been gathered. And the whole idea is that they will funnel down and figure out, you know, what, what is all this data telling us? What are the main issues? What are the target subjects that we need to learn about here in the classroom? What projects can we do that would ha have a, a make a real difference within the prison? So some examples of projects that um, have come up, and these again are just a handful, but um, I mentioned earlier on for those that might have been on the call about the two sunny days that we've had in Ireland this week, which is the equivalent of our whole summer. But nonetheless, um, when those two days come each year, it's very important that people understand, um, you know, how to protect themselves um, from UV rays um, within the prison. So we worked with the Irish Cancer Society on this poster here you might see, which was adapted their poster was a, was not suitable for a prison because in prisons they can't wear hats and there's not always a lot of shade, um, etc. So we worked with them to develop this poster, um, which is put up in, in each of the prisons. And the volunteers' role is to ensure that the sun cream dispensers are filled every summer um, and this pr project is rolled out. Um, we've done projects on, um, you know, information about tuberculosis and the truth, trying to, um, I suppose, encourage people to watch out for signs and symptoms, etc. Um, obviously, they played a huge role during, dare I mention the word COVID, but during the, the COVID pandemic, um, where they, um, when the prisons were in lockdown, um, the volunteers had a very, um, I suppose, important role in going from door to door um, and developing leaflets that they could um, simplify the public health messages for people um, in prison and, you know, explain to those in isolation, you know, what the, 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 the procedures were going to be. Um, so, you know, from first aid to addiction supports, to mental health and well-being, you name it, the volunteers have done a project around it over the last couple of years. Um, and they really do come up with the most amazing ideas. And um, we try not to prescribe too much um, so that the buy-in is from the volunteers themselves. And so, you know, they are really invested in what they're doing because it's come from them through the community assessment. It's their idea. We're a team um, that is providing the the wraparound support to make it happen for them and and unlocking the 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 gates i suppose to 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 mobilize them in in this sort of environment but um it works and we've had you know a lot of research done over the last couple of years that can pay testament to that also um, just to mention that, you know, when they finish the course, the course usually lasts from six to nine months of the year. Um, but that doesn't mean the end of the volunteers to continue vol volunteering um, while they're in prison, but more specifically um, to volunteer when they leave prison, which is an, an important um, aspect of the programme. Um, we developed this side of the programme in 2015 with the, the, the probation service and we now have um, volunteers who have left prison um, who, who are interested in getting involved, want to become facilitators and are facilitating elements of the programme to people under the supervision of the um, probation service. 
Um, so clients of the probation service or their funded projects throughout the country. So it's a huge opportunity, especially in the couple of months post prison where, um, you know, um, I suppose reoffending rates would be typically quite high. Um, it can be very difficult for people to adjust back into their family lives to be able to establish a whole new routine for themselves. This can be something that's known to them, that they have been involved in for a while, that is able to continue for them um, and hopefully keeps them on the, the right path. So, Graeme, are you with us? I hope so. Or maybe we have time for a question or two. Sorry. Yeah, to, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Because Sorry. Sure, I mean, so many questions come up, and I know that we have lots of participants. We are almost how many? We're 74 people on the call right oh. now. And the last presentation you did in the spring also, where we had other national societies presenting what they were doing. So that's one of the questions that came up with for me. Because, uh, we in the last presentation we had Danish Red Cross talking youth talking about their program for youth so is there any specific tracks tracks for youth uh, who are uh, inmates what about females males because we've seen pictures mostly of males two questions yes yeah, yeah. okay so um with the, regards to the youth question first um so we have um one prison um one detention center um in Ireland that it has now closed down um which was called St Patrick's Institution um and in St Pat's when it was open we did manage to run the CBHFA program with the 18 to 25 year olds there um now um we are in the process of working with Oberstown Youth Detention Centre um which uh, is now the new home for um i suppose the youth offenders um and um we are in the process of working with them to develop the program there so that will be something that will be coming hopefully in 2024 but um through the experience of working with St Patrick's um institution and Graham will talk will, was was around for that for that pilot um but there we've had to adapt the program a little bit to to be um suitable for that age cohort absolutely um Graham do you have anything to add on the pilot in St Pat's with the youth you're on mute sorry uh Carrie say again please Yes, do you have anything to add on the the um the question was about involving youth in the CBHFA program and I explained that we are hoping to to go into Oberstown to pilot the program but we did in the past um pilot it in St Pat's institution. Oh yes, we did, yeah. Um uh, piloting it with uh, uh younger people particularly in the 18 to 21 uh sorry, uh 16 um, upwards um, was a real challenge, a huge challenge because they are a different cohort. Um, getting their attention and keeping their attention was a problem. And what we did in the end um, is we brought uh, some Red Cross volunteers, adults from the adult prison, two of them, who we trained as trainers and brought them in and they facilitated it. And hey presto, it worked. Um, so, uh, you know, it shows the importance of having uh, peers as such as opposed to, uh, to professional people, because it would not have worked if we had carried on with these young people. Um, so that's an important lesson for the future. Okay. Yes. And then the, the other question was about females. So, yes, the, the pictures were um, were all male, but we have two uh, female prisons here in Ireland and the program is operating um, very successfully in both of those. Um, what we find with the uh, in the female prisons is that we tend to run shorter courses um, because the women typically tend to be doing shorter sentences typically than the men. So we will condense slightly the programme and then the projects will will run on longer, I suppose, than than they would. But in terms of projects, um, the women have done incredible things with regards to um, 
building, um, rebuilding and strengthening relationships with their children. Um, they've done period poverty projects, et cetera, for people that, you know, do not have enough sanitary products in the prison, believe it or not, um, at times. So, um, you know, the projects that they would have been um, developing would have been very specific to, I suppose, women's health and well-being. Um, I see. I see another question yes. here um, yes. that has come up. Yes, um, if it's okay that uh, we take the questions um, at the round after the presentations. Um, okay. Yeah. Owen and Adam. And Adam, it's okay for you too. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. I have many questions, but I will keep them very quiet. Yeah. yeah. But Kerry, you're fantastic. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Yes. I know it's been very brief, but hopefully you've got a, an idea of what it's about. I see some of the questions coming up, but I'll let Graham give his presentation and then we can um we can come back to the drawing board yeah. then. Thank you, Alan. Okay. Um thanks very much, Kerry. Um yeah. Uh, Carrie's uh, uh, presentation uh, ties it up very well in terms of Ireland, and we've been doing this now for 14 years. And based upon that and the experience we've gained, we seem to have lost. Okay, Graham, we lost you, so you have to start almost from the beginning okay can you hear me yes yeah okay i'll start from the beginning can i just check that you can hear me please yes okay that's fine thanks um just we developed um a global hub for community-based health in detention the irish red cross um with a, an agreement mou signed with icrc and the federation in 2022. Um, the reason um, that this has been set up um, is because with the 14 years of experience we've had um, through an action research approach, we've gained a great deal of experience about how to um, sustain this program. Um, and uh, other national societies have asked for assistance. We have helped our uh, trained and uh, supported the implementation in uh, Australia and in Norway where it's functioning very well and ICRC approached us in 2021 to um, to ask us to set up a global hub uh, for this uh, to uh, encourage the dissemination of this methodology um, in other jurisdictions. Um, the global hub is a, um, is a sort of smaller version of a reference center. Um, it is very, it's national society based. It's led by the Irish Red Cross, but we're very much working in, in um, participation with uh, Norwegian Red Cross and others. Um, and as Carrie has said in Ireland, mental health well-being is probably the top issue in all the prisons, in all the jurisdictions that we have been uh, engaged with. Um, when we were having meetings in Geneva earlier this year, we met with MH PSS um, and um, made it very clear that we, you know, we really do need to work closely with you um, for that component. Um, we um, have got basically uh, a framework which you can see in front of you, um, where we, the overall aim is to improve health and well-being de people deprived of their liberty, and but it's specifically through peer-to-peer -peer interventions. There's an organisational objective, which is setting up the global hub, established as a movement coordinated approach um, to provide tools, implementation, training, support, uh, and community. Uh, communities of practice network for the CBHFA in places of detention. And as you can see, there are three results that we're looking to achieve there um, um, in uh, under that particular objective. The second objective is an operational objective where we will, uh, in a hands-on way, um, provide um, training and implementation support 
to uh, national societies and their detention authorities um, uh, in pilot projects. And this year, uh, or the end of 2023, December, we will be bringing um, uh, certain people that are going to be involved in this implementation from Honduras Red Cross and Colombia Red Cross. Um, we have been we are supporting also countries in Europe, but supporting countries in Europe is a, an awful lot easier, as you can imagine, than um, uh, dealing with prisons in Colombia and in Honduras. Um, but ICRC wants us to wants us to test out this methodology and adapt it so that um, uh, we can implement the methodology to improve health. Uh, and well-being in the pilot prisons in those two countries. And, and the training in Ireland will take place in December, where we will train the implementers, including the prison governors, because it's very important we've learned over the years that the Red Cross cannot implement this on its own. It has to be driven by the prison service as well. Um, then the implementation period um, will be between, or sorry, the implementation training for the National Society and the Correction Service will, will be carried out between January and the middle of March um, in 2024. And then the implementation period starts, which will be um, an action learning approach. And you can see from uh, this uh, uh, slide in front of you, the approach we've used from the beginning of 2023 through um, to the end of 2024, where we will um, have an evaluation of the process, not just the content. And we're using a realist approach um, because what we're interested in finding out here is, you know, what is it about this program that works? In what context, how and why? Um, so that we can adapt it and evaluate its impact, but from a realist perspective. We have an international, uh, sorry, uh, an academic partnership with the university, and I receive students for three months, Masters of Public Health, and they will be in 2020 um, activities. Um, so that's, um, and, uh, and I, uh, we, uh, we've been starting in Europe in pilots next year, build that capacity so that the So um, that's where we are um, at the moment. Um, and like I said, we would really like to engage with you over the next few months. Um, with the MHPSS component of what we're going to be doing. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was extremely exciting and interesting, and I'm sure that we all have loads of questions. And uh, we have also invited Sarah Saibia to present, and now we're going to give you a moment to think, those of you who have a question or two that you want to keep for later. While we get the slides up for Sarah that we're going to be managing from this side, from this end, and then we're going to introduce the next speaker, which is our Cyber Tennis Red Cross. So, can I? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sarah, just a moment. Yeah. I'd like to find well, your presentation, and you can talk about yourself. Why don't you present yourself in the meanwhile? <laughs> I'd rather not. But yeah. briefly, I, I, I work for the Danish Red Cross. Uh, I'm an advisor in relation to uh, mental health and psychosocial support in emergencies. And um, well, for the past many years, I've I've um, worked with with different national societies um, and done lots of trainings on psychological first aid. And throughout the years, um, I've always been faced with questions from volunteers uh, in particular around the complex reactions and situations that they often find themselves in. And for many years, I sort of skipped over that part thinking, gosh, I need to be a trauma psychologist to talk about this or 
you know, I, I need a specialist by my side. I need Patricia standing next to me in order to do this. Um, and basically, I got more and more frustrated <laughs> with this situation. And um, finally, uh, this year, we decided to pilot a psychological first aid training focusing on complex reactions and situations by a lay person for a lay person. That was kind of the idea. So how do we break this down in simple ways for staff and volunteers who are dealing with people in high distress? So how do we explain a panic attack, for example? How do we explain dissociation in a way that is easy to understand and also what to do, what to say, how to behave uh, in those situations? So what I'm trying to frame here is basically this is nothing new as such. Um, if you look at the IFRC Reference Center's uh, PFA guide, there's a whole section on complex reactions and, and situations also for children. Um, and, and there's a description of what to do with people who are angry, uh, people who are uh, having a panic attack, um, su uh, suicidal, um, and I think also sort of people who are facing sudden loss. So there, there are, a lot of it is already described in the guide. Um, <clears throat> the Austrian Red Cross has also, I know, uh, been rolling out something very similar, uh, but specifically targeting uh, ambulance services. So this was an attempt to develop something that could be more generic, we hope, uh, which national societies could, could take on. Um, and, and the aim is really to target the frontliners. It's this is for, for 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 the staff and volunteers who are out there, like the emergency response teams in the Ukraine Red Cross currently. And um, and we had the great privilege of of actually being able to pilot this training in Ukraine in May. And um, here you can see um, an angry person. <laughs> uh, and if we start the presentation, I can explain a bit more. Can you see it? Yes, I okay. see some. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So the training content, we, we piloted this with 16 uh, people from the Ukrainian Red Cross. Four of them were from the Mental Health Psychosocial Unit because we obviously hope that they will be the ones who will be able to continue uh, rolling out this kind of training. Um, and then we had 12 members of the emergency response team in Ukraine. So these are emergency responders who are called out um, when there have been uh, explosions, uh, natural disasters. You may have heard of the dam that burst and there was a lot of flooding. So they were also involved in saving lives and evacuating people during that time. And obviously, as you can all imagine, uh, it's it's not only the emergency responders in Ukraine, but all across um, the world and with so many national societies, we have so many situations where where our staff and volunteers are responding um, to to very uh, dramatic situations. So the idea is basically that this would fit into your regular psychological first aid training. So it's the prepare, look, listen, link. But that when you come to the part, the practical parts where you're doing the role play, where you are asking people to 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 try their look, listen skills, uh, then you would focus more on complex uh, reactions. And so um, <clears throat> this training, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this training was conducted by a specialist, <laughs> a trauma psychologist, um, and I was co-facilitating part of it. Um, so, and, and we did this because we wanted to make sure that even though we're simplifying the language, we wanted to make sure that we were still being very accurate in terms of what it, of what it is we were describing. So Eva Barnovitz is um, the psychologist who was with me at the time, uh, developed the curriculum um, with, with input from my side in terms of contextualizing it to the Red Cross Red Crescent setting. 
We talked about physical reactions to distressing events, the brain and the autonomic nervous system. I think the autonomous might be German. Well, autonomic nervous system. Uh, building personas for practice. I will explain that in a moment. Um, practicing those personas. And then we ended with the importance of self-care and team care. You can go on to the next slide. So first, Ava was explaining um, the body and what happens in, in, in situations of high distress. Um, so she very briefly went through the parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, but in a very simple way by asking uh, participants, what kind of stress reactions have you seen? And then based on what they were describing, she would be she was pointing out and saying, OK, that could be this. That could be, you know, so here we're more over in the sympathetic here. We're more over in the parasympathetic. Next. Um, and so for many of you, this might be familiar. So she also then talked about. The different uh, reactions and. So the fight and the flight and the freeze and sort of where you can go into a state of dissociation. So the, the different reactions that they were describing and how we can put them on this curve going from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic. So that was also explained in a very simple way, simply using the examples that people had mentioned and then just saying, OK, we think that they are in fight or they're in flight or they're in freeze and so on. Yeah. Then the fun part for me as a layperson, <laughs> if you could all, could you all just put up your hand? Yeah. So this is how we explain, this is neurobiology for children. I love it. So this is your brain. I'd like you to put your thumb in here, inside, yeah. And then your fingers down. Okay. Your fingers, are what we call the professor, the prefrontal cortex. That's your thinking brain. That's how you connect with people. That's how you make decisions. Here we have the limbic system. These are your emotions. And here we have what we call the reptile brain, or also known as the autonomic nervous system that kicks in your, um, your the brain stem. So what happens when you are highly distressed is that the prefrontal cortex will go off. Your limbic system, your emotional regulation system goes off and you are left with this. And what we wanted to achieve was to help staff and volunteers understand how to bring people back online. So that's how we explained it. And as you can see here, in a situation of life threat or emergency, the professor and the cat brain basically go offline and leave every decision to the lizard brain. So you can see the lizard at the bottom, and then there's the cat, and then there's the professor. So I think one of the important key messages, which was really, I could really see people reflecting when, when, when she said this was, Actually, in these situations, it's the lizard brain that makes the decision for you. And for many people, when they've been exposed to a traumatic event and they have reacted in certain ways, for example, going into freeze, they blame themselves. How come I didn't fight? How come I didn't escape? Why did I just freeze? Why didn't I do anything? And for them, Understanding that it actually wasn't your decision because you were offline really, really meant a lot to a lot of people in the room, I could feel. And it also helped them to understand the people that they're dealing with. So all of this has come from the fact that a lot of volunteers, um, for example, first aiders have come up to me and said, yeah, but, you know, I keep I keep shouting, I keep repeating myself and they can't hear me. They can't understand what I'm saying. I don't know what's going on. And so by explaining it in this way, volunteers and staff can understand, OK, this is why I need to help this person get back online, because that's the only 
way they're actually going to start to understand what it is I need them to be doing now. Next. So we wanted this to be very practical and hands on. So we asked this, the, 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 the group uh, of participants to come up with scenarios that they found challenging. What were the, the complex reactions they found challenging? And being very angry, angry and aggressive was the first one, which funnily enough is mentioned in the PFA guide <laughs> as one of the complex reactions. And um, what we focused on was, so, so they developed this uh, story about Oleg, who you can see there, and they explained everything that they, they had seen and felt and heard and experienced with Oleg. And based on that, we focused on, okay, what do you say to someone like Oleg? What do you actually do? How do you use your voice and how do you use your body? And that's how the whole training uh, proceeded with when it came to the reactions. That's how we went through each complex reaction. So you can move on. So here in Ukrainian, what you see is the what to say, what to do, your body language and so on uh, on the right side. And we asked them, what do you do? What do you say? What is your body posture like? And so on. And then we added the, the points that we, we, we thought were missing in relation to that. You can go to the next one. The next one was Vera. Vera uh, experiences an explosion in a marketplace and is completely frozen and nobody can get through to her. Um, and so here we talked about dissociation and what to do in the situation of, well, freeze, but also dissociation and how to bring someone back. Um, and again, with the same uh, concept of what to do, what to say, all of it from them. And then we um, added uh, relevant points. And the next one. And this one was a panic attack and uh, suicidal. And the next one um, was a distressed child. OK. Um, if you can just, yeah, so just to go back to, to how it worked. So um, Ava and I demonstrated what a panic attack could look like and what could be done. And then we asked them to go in buddy pairs to practice. So they had about 40 minutes of practice with each reaction. And then they came back and shared um, their learnings from that. So I, I think the fact that they actually got to practice it, you know, with someone who was in this very sort of distressed state and, and, and you know, the agitation or, or the state of dissociation where there is no response at all and how challenging that can be. The fact that they got to practice this at length, I mean, really, I think made a, made a huge difference. And, and, and that's what um, we warmly recommend should be the main content of this training is practice, practice, practice. And then we ended up with um, self-care and team care, because everything we had talked about, basically, we had people in the room who were also having some of these reactions themselves or had colleagues who um, were uh, in distress. And so this was helping them also to know how can we help each other. So we talked about uh, the window of tolerance. Um, I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. We talked about post-traumatic stress disorder. We talked about burnout. So we talked about the things that if you continue to do this kind of work and you don't take care of yourself, you can put yourself at risk. And one of the key messages was, do you want to last and be like the tea candle? Or do you just want to be sparkling for a short moment and then you fizz out? And if you want to be like a candle, well, then you've got to practice the self-care and team care. And then, of course, we went into <clears throat> different, <clears throat> different strategies um, <clears throat> for self-care and team care. Sorry. Uh, next. So the window of tolerance. Um, 
focusing on the fact that normally um, we are in in the in the green in the middle. Uh, so this is the optimal uh, arousal zone where we are able to function, able to make decisions. We can tolerate a bit of stress. We can process information and so on. Um, and what happens for many of our staff and volunteers, for many of the people who are on this call right now, is that when we experience too much stress, um, we go out of our window of tolerance um, and we go either towards too much hyperarousal or hypoarousal. So we, we explain this in, 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 a, in a very simple way um, in relation to the, the self-care. Yeah. So here you have the fantastic team of Ukrainian Red Cross uh, MHPSS and emergency responders um, who very patiently for four days uh, went through this piloting uh, four days because we had to do it with uh, interpreters from English to Ukrainian and back again. So their patients, I don't know how they put up with us. And some of them were actually um, responding to emergencies during this training and coming in just after and sitting down eagerly uh, participating. Um, so it was so impressive uh, to be with them. And um, in terms of next steps, what we're hoping is that um, this will be reviewed by, I mean, we're hoping that the, the reference center will take a look, um, the Ukraine Red Cross, uh, Patricia also has to go through it, um, and the IFRC Europe office um, as well. And then we're hoping to make this a more generic package um, that for the Danish Red Cross anyway, we would like to train uh, Danish Red Cross delegates on this package and hopefully then they will be able to also then um, train uh, National Society counterparts. So those are sort of the next steps and um, yeah, I think I'll I'll stop here. Thank you, Sarah. Great, I think um, now we're going to open the floor for questions. We were thinking at the beginning to um, that we go in groups, but I think um, we came up uh, and we decided that we, we will stay all together so we can hear um, the interesting discussion. Um, I had a, a list uh, of uh, already hands up. So maybe I think, yeah, Owen, um, the floor is here for your question. Oh, great. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to everyone involved for two fantastic pres uh, presentations. They, they were so, so interesting. Um, I suppose I had two questions for, um, uh, I suppose, Carrie. Uh, hi, Carrie. I'm an Irishman myself, and I did work with the Irish Red Cross before in the international department. So it was uh, lovely to hear a familiar accent. Um, I've got one, just two questions, and I'll try and be quick. One is very specific. Um, it relates to the fact that I, I, I was familiar with your program already, and I recall that there was a huge impact uh, on the rates of uh, blade crimes, um, assaults with bladed weapons in the prisons, and I was blown away by how successful that was. But my question was, you also mentioned lower, um, you know, a, a, a lesser likelihood that people who were very engaged with the program would reoffend, uh, say, in the year after their release or something like this. Are there actually any rates? Has anyone looked at differences in recidivism rates, uh, depending on whether or not they engaged in the program? Hi, all. Nice to hear from you. And a fellow Irish accent is always very welcome. Um, but yes, yeah, so first of all, in terms of the um, the blade um, experiment, so um, basically what we did was um, there in one of the prisons, um, there was a lot of instances, 98 percent of all assaults, prisoner on prisoner assaults were with using a cutting weapon. Um, and um, the volunteers wanted to do something about it. The, the prisoners themselves wanted to do something about it. it started with a survey um, trying to an anonymous survey. 
um, trying to determine why people were carrying blades. Um, and mostly it was for security. So they were carrying blades because they knew other people were carrying blades. It wasn't because they wanted to inflict violence um, on, on others. Um, so it was more of a protective measure. So what we did was um, we had the volunteers um, advocate on the on their landings and um, sharp spins were put in um, obscure areas um, and people had the opportunity to dispose of their weapons within the amnesty week. Um, and there was quite a number of, um, of, of, of blades turned over during that week. Um, so in this, the, the following three months of the prison management and recording incidences within the prisons, um, that had reversed to 6% of prisoner on prisoner assaults were with using a cutting weapon in the, the following three months post the amnesty. So we've since owned, um, repeated that amnesty in various prisons where times of um, I suppose when uh, stress um, and, and tensions are high within the prison. So we do repeat that um, from time to time. With regards to the reoffending rates, um, it's still relatively early um, to kind of make any um, sweeping statement as such, but we are absolutely in the process of gathering information. We're working with the Central Statistics Office to try uh, and the probation service um to work out how we go about um i suppose tracking the volunteers that have um i suppose been released from prison and how many have come back etc i will say that in our um in what's coming out um so far it is showing that um 75 percent of our volunteers have not reoffended in the three years post leaving. But again, it, it's a longitudinal piece. So that's very early kind of positive indicators, but it's something that we're we're following up on. Thank, thank you so much for that. And if I can be cheeky and, and just ask one other question and hopefully it will be of relevance to other people. Uh, clearly the Irish Red Cross is, is taking a lead on this. And you mentioned that you're, you're a hub or as Dr. Simmons put it, a, a sort of a smaller version of a reference center. Uh, I work for an organization where the work that you've been doing is of huge relevance because we go into places of detention, um, but it's mostly with a legal or accountability focus in relation to torture. However, this would seem like an ideal component to add as an MHPSS component to such work. And I'm just wondering what type or level of support or guidance could the, the Irish hub of uh, these community-based programs play? Um, is there any kind of support on offer for people? Graham, do you want to take that question? You're just on mute at the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in terms of uh, what you're talking about, um, we've been in, uh, we're working with the ICRC, and uh, an issue that we will probably face is, is this, uh, particularly in these America's pilots. Um, we are going to uh, include in the training uh, the minimum protection approach. Um, and we are actually discussing with ITRT how we might be able to uh, begin with this and how that would help. Thank you very much to you both. Yes. Thank you. After it was Adam. Yeah. Yes, uh, very quickly, and I'll be very brief, but I also have lots of uh, things in my head at the moment. So first of all, I think all three presentations were excellent and I was really humbled by them and I, I thank you all for showing them. Um, my question for you, Kerry, is actually, did you tender for this work? Um, and if so, how did you do it? But also um, the data that you collect, what was the data that you were going to evaluate? Um, so hi Adam. Um, in terms of uh, tendering, so we're we're lucky at the moment. Um, we are funded through dormant account funds um, here in Ireland. Um, so that has been that has provided one hundred percent of the funding for the 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 rollout of the program in the prisons for the last six or seven years. And previous to that, um, the um, Irish Red Cross, the Irish Prison Service um, would have um, funded it 
I suppose, while it was in pilot, while it was in the pilot format. Um, so, no, we haven't tendered out. Graham, do you want to add anything on that? You're on mute. Yeah. OK, I think I think you can hear me now. Yeah, um, no, uh, we have considered it in the sense that um, we we were awarded this um, dormant account fund uh, in 2016, and it was repeated then um, uh, for a second three years and then a third three years. And now we've got uh, another three years coming up. Uh, um, however, um, we were also um, looking at other sources of funding in case the uh, uh, the dormant funding uh, didn't um, uh, didn't come through. However, um, we were told by the Irish Prison Service Director General that even if the dormant account fund did not come through, the prison service itself would continue to fund it because it's they regard it as so critically important, especially with the experience of COVID where um, in, a, in a lot of ways the volunteers um, saved the day. Um, so uh, I don't think we'd be going out to tendering at the moment. No, that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much. And as so kindly, I think all three presentations were fantastic. And um, and Zara, your training sounds amazing. So if you would like to share it with us, that would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, we always like to learn new things um, in the British Red Cross. Uh, yes, I mean, the, the idea is certainly uh, to share it. Um, anyone who's interested, uh, once we, we've you know got it approved as a Red Cross Red Crescent tool, um, then it's all yours. That's very kind of you. That's my only questions. And thank you each for your presentations today. They're absolutely wonderful. Yeah, so um, uh, any other questions for Sarah? And thank you again, Sarah, for I would like to uh, again also say that was really exciting to hear about. Um, anybody has more specific questions for Sarah about the um, the training that that was developed? Not at the moment. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mo yeah. yes, yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry, could I uh, ask uh, Sarah? Um, this program itself, what, um, what form would it take? I mean, is it a, a interactive course um, over how long? Um, some details. Yes, so normally uh, a regular psychological first aid training can be done in a day. Um, it can also be longer if you have the luxury of time, but uh, a basic sort of crash course on psychological first aid, it can usually be done in a day, so a, a day of training. Um, and what we're hoping to do is then think of this as a as a two day uh, package, where so that you have the time to really uh, focus on on practicing um, how to respond to these uh, complex reactions. Um, so we're aiming for two days uh, as part and parcel of a regular uh, psychological first aid training, and. Um, we want to ensure that people are obviously properly trained to be able to then further cascade this. Um, so we will also be clarifying in the in the in the training module what the criteria will be for for anyone who wishes to to conduct this training. We have we have more questions coming up, but maybe I should add that the big theme of this year's forum and training in the ENP, MHPSS EN, the European Network, is trauma informed practices and approaches. Hmm. And I think that that's another addition that needs to be in all the PFA trainings. Um, so I just want to say that, add that. I think that's really important. Yeah. We have somebody who's not muted. Can we and we have two others who want to ask questions, so please. Yes, open your mic. I think uh, Maureen. Hello, hi, how are you? Thank you all for this these presentations. I have one question, not not a question, one thing to Zara that because I'm from Lebanon and in Lebanon and I think we have I've seen a lot of uh, people, Lebanese people here as well. We had the Beirut explosion and uh, the National Mental Health did also a training in PFA for complex cases. 
and we developed they developed actually i was one a trainer with them uh, they developed a very huge one that uh, um, includes uh, also this dissociation that include uh, as well panic attacks, but also uh, how to work with lactating women, with pregnant women and new parents, with older persons, and uh, what to give parents as tips how to work with their adolescents, with their children, and with risk beha with behaviors at risk. So also it would be good. I don't know if you would have any, if you have, of course, you have contact with the uh, IFRC and the RC in Lebanon. It would be great to, uh, I think it is good to see how could it, it could work in the Middle East as well and in Lebanon specifically. So this is only uh, because really I, I can say that it was really great how uh, all of these were taken into consideration in, in the training. And I I have wrote a question for Carrie, um, and I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I, I I joined a little bit late, but uh, I was asking about the selection of prisoners. Is the program is for everyone? In one group, do you put everyone, or you can? It depends on the crime they have done. We know. I'm not sure in Ireland how it goes, but in Lebanon we have different uh, crimes together, different people with different crimes together. So you have inmates who, who don't have any remorse, who don't have uh, any kind of being willing to, to really uh, uh, change their behavior as well, the purpose of a all of that so they've done the crime because they believe or uh, you have pedophiles you have a lot of crimes so ethical and non-ethical and so do you have so do you select people and you have different programs to different people and did you do anything and also in the prisons we have a lot of people with different mental health issues with schizophrenia with bipolar with addictions so also did you take this into consideration there was there was some risk management uh, suicide management uh, safety of course for the volunteers as well and for the inmates themselves thank you so these are my question this is my question Thank you, Maureen. Um, so um, in here in Ireland, um, different people with different crimes mix within the prisons, um, with the exception of, um, I suppose, protection. This, there are certain um, groups of prisoners that would be on protection. Um, so generally, the program is open to all. So when it is advertised, anybody within the prison is able to put their names down to join the group. Um, however, those names are sent to prison management um, and they will have a look at their um, records, etc. And just try and, I suppose, ensure as best they can that they're there for the right reasons. And they're not involved in anything that would um, harm the emblem in any way. Um, so there is, I suppose, security screening that it does um, happen um, as part of the program. And then for the rest of the, the course, those that are, are, are participating in the program, um, they're monitored by the, the, the operational team. So if they were to become involved in something or use the, um, the Red Cross as a means of doing something that they shouldn't be doing, um, that the operational team that is assigned to the Red Cross that is supporting the Red Cross program would be looking out for this and in tune with this sort of stuff. And where that happens, that volunteer would be removed from the group. Um, interestingly enough, um, the seven principles play a huge part in this. So um, that's why we 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 spend a lot of time on the print the seven principles um, and ensure that they have a good understanding of what the words mean. So they can be big words, and especially for people with literacy issues, um, they usually break it down to what does humanity mean as a prisoner here in Port Leash Prison or, you know, to you as a, a, a person, etc. Um, so we ensure that they have a good understanding of what they're actually signing up um, to model the seven fundamental principles. And that's mm. one of the main expectations that we would have of them. 
Um, but we do in prisons, um, in some prisons, we have protection prisoners mixing with ordinary prisoners, which does not happen um, outside of the Red Cross program. So for all other educational um, per, uh, classes or um, exercise or anything recreational, they would be segregated, but have signed up to the seven fundamental principles of the program. They understand their meaning. And as part of this, they agree to work to work together because it's, you know, they're they're impartial, basically. Thank you very much. Are you going to publish this program? So we we have a, some research on the Irish Red Cross website. Um, so we have a partnership with um, we have a couple of pieces of research ongoing at the moment. One is the recidivism piece, which we have been talking about earlier. Um, but we're also working on um, with the University College in Cork here in Ireland. Um, one of the, our main universities is partnering with us on um looking at the personal development of a volunteer as they navigate through the program. So we've seen change in people. So this has been anecdotally, I suppose, um, seen in the prisons in terms of, you know, their behavior has changed. They've become a Red Cross volunteer and something in them has clicked and it's, you know, had a huge impact on their um I suppose their behavior within the prison or their outlook in general so we're doing some research to kind of find some concrete ev evidence around that um but we have also partnered with the um University of um Ontario in um Western University in Ontario in Canada and we have students that come over each year that would evaluate certain elements of the program so we'll pick um different parts that we want to kind of look at in more detail each year. So fragmented research um, that I suppose is out there, um, but it's something that we really want to kind of engage more in um, over the next couple of years and kind of really what we know is happening. We need the evidence. Um, I suppose we need it on paper. Thank you very much. And I also want to add that actually the program is on the EU portal for best practices. Yeah. So you can also find it there, which so it's recognized by the EU as a best practice program. This is where you can also find more information and on the website, um, as you said, Carrie, could you put the or we can put it. It's in the invitation for this yeah. meeting. There's a link yeah. over to you. Yeah. Graham yeah. and after yeah, yeah just saying that there's also a couple, uh, some papers that have been published particularly one that's very interesting that maybe Carrie we could share with with everyone and that was published in 2022 in the Irish Psychologist um, that looks at um, uh, a study of volunteers with this idea of change and and personal development undertaken by uh, a master's in applied psychology students. Um, as a research project, and it was published, and we can share that with you because I think that's really quite useful. Can um, we can upload it on our website um, once we upload the recording of this webinar because more people will be interested and more people will be seeing the webinar. Those who couldn't be here today. Yeah. Thank you. Better. Yes. Yeah, so uh, just in response um, to to um, the mental health and psychosocial program of the Lebanese Ministry of, of Public Health. Um, firstly, just to say I'm, I'm very familiar uh, with Lebanon. I, I lived there for many years and uh, I will certainly never forget um, the explosion as I was there myself. Um, but I just wanted to say that uh, we are aware of, of the materials that have been developed by, by, the, uh, by the National uh, Mental Health and Psychosocial Program in Lebanon. Um, and thinking of it as it, this all happened as a response to the explosion, um, but it's also going to help many people in the future in Lebanon in, in, in so many other ways. And uh, I remember when it happened, when the explosion happened, um, many of my Lebanese friends um, actually had flashbacks from the civil war. And so we were also able to help people um from that generation so i think lebanon is an amazing example of how someone with not just someone but a group of people with great determination and grit uh 
you know, put MHPSS uh, up front and and really manage to to promote it uh, at a as as a national health plan. So that's um, just to say something I've I've always admired. Uh, but in short, when we develop material, we're very much focusing on volunteers of national societies. Um, so it's a very specific Red Cross, Red Crescent context, and and that's why we sometimes. Uh, maybe from the outside, when you look in, you think, why are they developing something that's already been developed? <laughs> but it's more because we adapted very much to to the very different context, cultural context um, that we work in. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think there is Anne uh, Johnston. You have your hands up. And are you with us? She's on, mute. She's on mute, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I think also, um, Andrea, you had a question in the chat. Ah, you're on Okay, I, I will read for you. Um, let me go up. So it's a question for Kari and Graham. Um, the training received by the volunteers is the same curriculum as the one they will use after the trainers. And I think that question could be also good for uh, Sarah. That's something that I, um, I will ask also for both presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anne, for the question. Um, so the volunteers would do a two day train the trainer um, course, so they would learn the basic facilitation skills. And then to start off with, we would usually train them as overdose prevention facilitators and um, in the violence prevention workshop also. Um, but from there, I suppose they are will have the basic facilitation skills. Some volunteers go on to teach elements of the program to the next cohort of volunteers. And in some prisons, um, in one of the female prisons, the, the course is entirely facilitated by trained volunteers. So I suppose once they do the, the facilitation skills workshop, um, I suppose that opens up um you know their the capability or their the opportunities to be able to facilitate more elements thank you um yeah and i mean from from our side what we're thinking in terms of a target group it would be a, a training of trainers um we think the ideal candidates would be either uh red cross red crescent staff who are involved in mhpss work or indeed uh, psychological first aid trainers um, who would then be trained to to train volunteers? Thank you, Mo. Um, may I? Yes. I'm sorry, folks. Um, I unfortunately I have to leave uh, the webinar at this moment uh, to attend another uh, meeting. So, um, Harry uh, will answer any further questions. Can I just ask that uh, it's really would be really important. Could we um, connect um, after this webinar um, to look at how we might integrate um, MHPSS in the pilots in Colombia and uh, in Honduras? If that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about the PS Center, of course, uh, we're happy mm -hmm. to be in touch. Absolutely yes, wonderful. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. It. I apologize to have to leave, but I, I'll yeah. leave you in Carrie's capable hands. Yeah, thank you for your time. And we Thanks are we're ending the webinar in five minutes because we know a lot of you go from one meeting to another. And as Fabio <laughs> said, you know, <laughs> health care is important. Hmm. So this is why we wanted to stop five minutes ahead of the next meeting that you can go to, so that you can have a Very little good. stretch, you can have a tea, you can have a <laughs> glass of water, whatever you want. And um, we're going to tell you, we, we have time for one more question. Anybody has a comment or question? Uh, how would you see this fit, the, what Sarah has presented, how would you see this fit in what you need in your national society? That was also one of the questions we wanted you to discuss. 
because of course it can't only be Sarah who has been frustrated with, with the difficult questions when training in psychological first aid. How would it fit? And I'm glad, Sarah, that you mentioned or that, that this is for, for with millions of volunteers and we have this pledge that they should all learn psychological first aid. So um, we're all um, chipping in on that. So how would it fit with, with the rest of you from national societies? I do realize that we have a lot who are not from national societies and you're also welcome to speak up. Nothing comes up immediately, but we have a request. Uh, if, yes. yes, Sarah Davidson, please, Sarah. Oh, there you are. Hi, H. Hi, H. Uh, great presentations. Thank you so much, everyone. I just wanted to say, I think we need to be really careful in the same way that we talk about a continuation of psychosocial and mental health uh, interventions. I think it would be really useful if we talked about that continuation in terms of our trainings as well, because mm. I think already there's been quite a lot of confusion about what psychological first aid actually is. So a lot of resistance by some to say, hang on, I can't possibly do a two day training when I'm doing a first aid course, which is just one day. So remember, we've got we've got resources that allow you to do basic psychosocial support in one hour or less. And then we've got these excellent resources that add to that. So I think it would be really good if we got the same vocabulary is what I would just suggest, you know, a bit like we populate the pyramid with basic psychosocial support, then psychological first aid and then approaches for complex reactions, etc. That's what I think we might need. Very good point. Point taken. Um, we have three more minutes. So um, Patricia and I are just going to go back and remind you that on 21st of September at noon, you can join us at the PS Centre for a webinar on the new manual out, which is out today and tomorrow. Supportive Voices, a framework for, um, for establishing and running MHPSS helplines, chat, or phone based. And Patricia, you had you wanted to yes. us to do a little end with a little exercise because you want yes. to present these again. Um, I had the opportunity today to discover that now we will have the well-being uh, guide as a set of cards. Um, when, are, when are you going to launch it? Well, it is here. <laughs> so, uh, looking forward to it to apply it in the training, mostly in caring for staff. Um, yeah. Should we try one? Yeah. Why to finish? Not okay. I will. When anxious and nervous. Oh, this this one is a long one. So, um, do you want to read it? Yes. <laughs> this is for climate anxiety. So we're going to end by um, making your climate anxieties diminish. Okay. So just close your eyes and focus for a moment and listen to the instruction. Okay. Clim Climate anxiety can leave anyone feel the spirit powerless and without a clue about what to do. When anxious about the clim climate crisis, remember that by identifying and acknowledge a feeling, it makes about it makes it both easier to understand what is happening to you as well to find ways to become an active agent. When not in any climate anxiety, think about a moment about each thing you can do yourself, with your friends, at work, at school, and as a volunteer to take actions against climate change. This is a way to support your well-being. To create a supportive environment, have a discussion with your peers, colleagues, family members, and other social circles using the following question. For example, what are your feelings about it and reactions to the issues of climate change? What can we do as individual and as a group to manage our reactions to climate change? And which actions can we take as individual and as a group to mitigate and stop the effects of climate change? Thank you very much. That was uh, a very nice exercise to end with and to go out into a day with a bit of thought about what we can do. I will bike home and not take the train. What about you? <laughs> we'll see you next time and we hope somebody else 
who has been taking the initiative for the PFA for All pledge, will run the next meeting. Patricia and I from Danish Red Cross International Department, the PS Center, we're leaving it with somebody else from the group. We will send all those involved in the group a mail so that you can take up the torch yes. and carry it on. And we support you, of course, to do it. Um, but yeah. we're... <laughs> thank you very much for your participation. Thank we're going to close the meeting. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. I <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we're just, just going to air.